right, as we continue looking at reconstruction, I've got a little shorter one for you here today. Um, remember the idea is we're evaluating how close can we get to Lincoln's desired goals of putting the country back together, ending slavery, and then working towards equality. Today is pretty much a strictly political uh, discussion of this. And what we're focusing on here today is the 15th Amendment, ratification of the 15th Amendment in 1870. The decision was made to add the 15th Amendment, which specifically protects the right of someone to vote regardless of race. Okay. And actually, I, I want to be very specific about this. What it says is a state cannot bar somebody from voting because of race. All right. The 15th Amendment does not actually protect anybody's right to vote. And it may sound like I'm being nitpicky with that, but it is really important to understand that there's a difference between those that kind of terminology that your right to vote is guaranteed versus it cannot be denied because of race. That's going to be important when we look at the, uh, the end of Reconstruction and what happens with the 15th Amendment, how it's interpreted. Going back to that first week of school, remember the, the Constitution is short, it's vague, it doesn't try and cover every situation. So it's up to the Supreme Court to actually figure out what do those words mean in reality. And so you need to actually understand the text of the 15th Amendment. Um, one of the things that's interesting about the 15th Amendment as well is that there was actually a small number of female suffragettes, the, you know, the people, of females that were working for women's right to vote, which in 1870, there was only one territory that let women vote, and that was Wyoming had allowed women the right to vote in 1869. But there was actually a few female suffragettes that were concerned that if they gave the right to vote to African-American males and did not give it to women. If, it, if the 15th Amendment mentioned race and it didn't mention sex or gender, um, one of them said it'll be a century before we get that fixed. Um, she was half right. It takes 50 years. You know, it was between the ratification of the 15th Amendment, which guarantees or extends the right to vote to African-American males and the 19th Amendment, which guarantees the right to vote regardless of sex or gender. Um, we'll talk about that later. So the, the point here is that actually for a little while, there was some African-American political power in the South. Um, most of our stories of Reconstruction are, again, stories of what might have been, but here for a little while there was a, a bit of African-American political power because if you combine the 15th Amendment, which extends the right to vote to African-American males, with the way that the radicals were running Reconstruction, which was they were in many cases barring former Confederates from having any sort of say so in Southern government as the Southern states were under martial law, there was a time period where African Americans might have more power than Southern whites. And so the result is that there's actually quite a few African Americans elected to Congress. Um, the first senator elected to Congress that's African American is a gentleman by the name of Hiram Rebels. And on your drawing there, Hiram Rebels is the one all the way on the left. One of the interesting little kind of you know, sweet ironies of this is that Hiram Rebels fills the, the position last held by Jefferson Davis. He is a senator from Mississippi, and the last person to hold that seat was Jefferson Davis, which you should remember Jefferson Davis was the president of the Confederacy. So that's just always been a little bit of a delicious irony that you know, Hiram Rebels, the first African-American senator, it takes the spot that was held by Jefferson Davis. Now, one of the things that we have to consider here, and again, we'll focus on this a little bit more tomorrow, is what has really changed in the hearts and minds of Southern whites in this. Yes, African Americans do gain some political power for a while as a result of the 15th Amendment, but 
Southern whites are not going to be barred from voting forever. That is not going to be a, a you know, part of this equation. And so then the question becomes, what's going to happen to African-American political power in the South when Southern whites regain the vote and in almost every place in the South, whites are in a majority. There's only a few places in the South where you would be able to circle a place geographically and say there's more African Americans here than there are whites. So what is going to happen to that when that when when whites are allowed to vote again? And again that'll be the focus more of tomorrow. But there for a while the Republican Party actually does have some power in the South, and the combined voting power of the newly freed slaves and the fact that the, the old Southern Democrats, the Confederates, are barred from voting does actually create a situation where the Republican Party is the dominant party in the South for a while. And again, this is probably not going to last. Two names that we need to know that represent that idea of Republican control of the South, and both of these terms would have been used as insults by Southern whites. The first name is Carpetbagger, and this the way to keep these two straight is to look really think about these terms. A Carpetbagger is a Northern Republican that goes into the South to run a business, take advantage of government reconstruction contracts, they, uh, they're, they're named after a type of luggage that was available at that time called a carpet bag. It was sewn together with carpet remnants. And the idea was that these people were looked down upon by Southern whites as these lowlifes from their perspective that were coming down there and taking advantage of their misfortune self-inflicted misfortune, but their misfortune to try and get rich. So Southern whites would have called them carpetbagger as an insult. Um, those are Northern Republicans that go South. Those are white Northern Republicans that go South. Some of them are really earnest in what they're doing. They see this almost as religious missionary work that they're going to bring the word of equality to the south but others are down there to take advantage of the economic opportunities which that's not illegal but it doesn't regardless of why they're down there southern whites don't want them there so that's why they use carpetbagger as an insult the other term that we need to know republicans that are in going in southern republicans obviously african americans are going to be with the Republican Party, and that's the party of Lincoln. You know, the Great Emancipator was a Republican, so that's where their votes are going to be. But you've got Northern Republicans that go South and carpetbaggers, and you do have some Southern whites that become Republicans. They, they're called scalawags. Um, as you see there, it's a Scottish word for scrawny cattle. I'm not exactly sure how that becomes applied to them. Um, scalawags would have been the non planter class southern whites that would have seen secession as the wrong thing to do. Almost like Andrew Johnson, um, but maybe a little bit less on the white supremacy side than Andrew Johnson. But these are southern whites that did not have much invested in the southern slave system. So they are going to see the Republican Party coming to the South as an opportunity for them to actually have some real political power. So you've got three blocks of voting for the Republican Party in the South. You've got African American votes that are going to go for the Republican Party, the party of Lincoln. You've got Northern whites that move South that are Republicans, the carpetbaggers. And then you've got Southern whites who see the Republican Party as an opportunity for advancement because they didn't have much under the old slave system and those are the scalawags. So African Americans, carpetbaggers, scalawags. The question is, how are they going to bring about real change if the majority of Southern whites aren't buying into what they're bringing? You know, in order for this to create real lasting change, there would have had to have been some real buy-in from the average Southern white person, and, because they are the majority in these areas. 
And the honest truth is that most Southern whites see this as an invading force. And this cartoon is a great representation of that. If you zoom in on it, put it, put it on your Google slide and really zoom in on it, you'll see that that's Ulysses S. Grant, who first conquering general, but then later president of the United States during the last eight years of reconstruction. He's riding in a carpet bag. And there's some terminology there. And if you look really closely at the carpet bag, you can see that it's bristling with weapons. Grant is actually sitting on like a pile of muskets, rifles. And Grant is riding on the back of a woman who's labeled the Solid South. And she is in chains carrying this weight of Grant and the carpetbaggers. This is a cartoon representation of what the average Southern white person thought of Reconstruction, that this was something that was being inflicted upon them by a conquering power that they had to fight to withstand. Now, just think about that for a second. Is there going to really be any lasting change coming out of Reconstruction if that is the attitude that the average Southern white person has towards Reconstruction. You can probably figure that one out before I even tell you tomorrow what happens to it and in particular.